Hey everybody and welcome back to another video. This is How to Invest, Spencer here. This one is going to be on Penn National Gaming. Let's hop straight into it. So we can see here the price is $74.71. This was actually the price action from Friday since the market was closed today on July 5th. I hope everyone had a good July 4th and got very drunk um, if you're of legal age. And the market capitalization is just under 12 billion. So I'm going to get into this uh, video kind of my bullish thesis and why I am thinking about um, starting to buy this stock um, as opposed to other stocks in the gaming industry and other stocks that um, uh, do gambling. So let's hop straight into the numbers. As I said, uh, the price was $74 and has been down on a downward trend for the past uh, about six months. If the, the chart wants to load, Ooh. we'll go to the full screen one here. So I have a sort of technical chart laid out from about almost a year and a half going back to last February. And we can see here it peaked in about March, at the very, um, almost towards the end of March, and it went all the way up to over $130, so double where it is today. That is one of my bullish thesis points, um, just the fact that it has fallen over 50% from a, a very recent high. But the channel that I have marked off here is from its most recent crash back in October of uh, 2020. So it was all the way up to almost $75 and crashed all the way back down to $56. So going down quite quite um, substantially. Um, and then from there, I drew a line from the bottom to the most recent um, candlestick, kind of giving us an accurate representation of um, just how the stock would be on um, without these really, really extreme outliers in candlesticks. They had a lot of positive um, buying pressure, and it ran up substantially from this low, from 56 all the way to 130, um, which is over 120%, which is a huge, huge run in the span of less than six months. So um, I kind of did the line, just kind of um, trying to gauge a, a steady incline. And you can see here, it, it even goes back to pre-COVID run. So it, it goes right back in line to um, kind of a very, very stable and consistent run in a stock, which is more of what you want. You don't want so much um, volatility if you're a share, um, just base, because if you are a long-term shareholder, you don't want to have to buy and sell and worry about um, having to really manage your account as much. Now, some people don't mind this, but um, actively managing is one of the um, more uh, nuanced and kind of hassle-based uh, kind of technique in the stock market. So most people don't want to have to be buying and selling constantly. They would rather a consistent, steady uptrend like this line. And that is why I drew it. And um, the other one is from its previous peak right before the crash. And then from there, I made it parallel. And um, this is the channel that I expect the stock to go through from the bottom that is forming here. Um, there's a pretty hard resistance, which is the third line that I drew here, um, at about $75 or 74, which it, um, it broke a couple times and has bounced off here. We can see it broke resistance and bounced off, broke resistance and bounced off, and broke resistance and bounced off. Um, but the main thing with the channel is, if it does break outside of the channel, that doesn't mean that you have to buy or sell the stock. It could be a good indicator for it, but it is really just vindictive. You have to oop, I'll undo that. I didn't mean to undo the drawing, but um, it is really vindictive. You have to take a closer look to the moving averages. And if the candlesticks are moving high above the moving averages, that means that um, you can still hold. And then um, as it breaks through some of these candlesticks and start to retest um, some of the supports, then um, you kind of gauge and see whether you want to sell off a little bit or you want to buy more on this dip if you're um, dollar co um, cost averaging. And um, 
So the main point I just want to say that you don't have to buy and sell if you're not um, within the channel. But you can make this for any stock that has been um, recently off its highs or had a quite substantial peak and then um, run afterwards. You can query these channels um, and then really base your moves off of whether it's in the channel and the moving averages. Um, that is the technical analysis for this and I will be moving back into some of the financial statements now. So um, we hit back here and we go to the statistics. This is where I really start to get bullish. Um, you can see in the chart that it is due for a, a, a pretty um, substantial uptrend because it has had a quite weak um, couple months due to um, some FUD in the market and just a lot of um, retail investors being hurt quite substantially and it being shorted um, as we can see here if we get further down but the forward P is a steal if we look at the rest of the market the rest of the market um, average price to earnings ratio is in the mid 20s and this is a 17 about 18 forward P on this company absolute steal um, another very intriguing number is the price to sales of uh, 2.96 so just under 3% which is quite low for a very, very high growth company such as this. Um, many high growth companies such as this have a double, if not um, triple digit number here. I've seen some up, upwards of four, which are just very, very expensive, which just means their price um, to what their product of selling is very, very high, um, which means they have a high multiple um, put on their stock price. And then their price to book is also quite good. Uh, less than five um, can't complain about that we get into some of the other numbers they're profitable already as such a young company um, partly in due to uh, their acquisition of barstool so they purchased 36 percent stake in bar school for 136 or 163 million dollars um, which would value barstool about a little bit above 450 million dollars as a company and what that has allowed them to do is really um, kind of take their focus away from the advertising um, for their company and they can really focus on becoming the best sports book as, as possible. Um, we'll be getting into DraftKings and I'm going to be comparing their numbers to DraftKings in just a minute, but that's where DraftKings has to spend a bunch of money, which is on uh, just advertising and they're losing a lot of money currently and they, they aren't um, looking to make money in, in the near term or the long term just because of um, a lot of advertising they have to, have to do, and a lot of um, deals to get customers engaged with their product. A lot of them have sign-on bonuses where it's you get 10 free dollars if you sign up in bettings, um, which is very similar to Robinhood. You get one free stock. Um, but the profit margin is uh, less than 1% currently, but that is only going to increase as um, this company matures. And their operating margin is 10%, which is pretty good for um, the infancy the company. Their return on assets is positive, which is always a benefit. Um, anytime that is positive, you can't really complain. Um, this looks like they might just be investing in bonds, looking at the number, uh, return on equity and return on assets, um, which is pretty similar to 10-year um, bonds currently. So I wouldn't be surprised if they were um, just playing it safe there and they don't want to lose any money. Um, their income statement, they made $3.74 billion in just the past quarter from uh, December to March in the first quarter. And their re um, revenue growth was 14%. So anytime you're above double digits, that is um, quite substantial quarter over quarter or growth um, or quarterly growth year over year. And then um, sort of a more... Um, uh, accurate representation of their uh, total cash that they're, they're generating for their free cash flow um, is their EBITDA, which is earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and depreciation, which is uh, 740 million. So each quarter they're generating 740 million um, earnings, just which um, is essentially cash that they can pay down debt, um, reinvest in the company, or um, really do anything they want, buy other businesses, mergers and acquisitions. Um, the only slight downside I would see here um, is as we get to the balance sheet. So they have $2 billion on the balance sheet and they have um, just over $11 billion in debt, um, which 
Um, they can pay down, obviously, $2 billion and only be $9 billion of debt, and they're generating $3 billion of uh, revenue and um, about $740 billion or $1 million of EBITDA. So they can pay down, you times 740 by four, you can get um, uh, over $3 billion. So you can pay that down in under three years, but that is um, pretty manageable, but that is one of the downsides as you compared it to some of the other gambling companies. They do have um, just a better balance sheet, I'll be honest. Um, but the last thing I wanted to get into is the share statistics. So 87, almost 88% of this company is held by institutions, which is head funds or just big firms, which means that big money is very, very bullish on this company. And uh, I hate to say it, big money is usually what me moves stocks. It's not usually retail investors. It's not usually Reddit hopping in and, oh, let's move this stock. It's, it's mostly people who have a couple million, a couple billion, a couple hundred million uh, dollars, and they're buying and selling the stock is what really moves it. And then uh, because it has moved quite substantially in the past year, year and a half, only 1.6% of insiders hold it. And um, the short percentage is also quite high. So there's um, almost 12% short. So if you add up 12% short, um, and to the percent held by insiders, there's almost no shares left to be bought. And um, sometimes the stock price isn't always based off fundamentals. And if the supply and demand is very off, out of whack, and there is very, very little supply of the stock, um, that is known as, uh, more commonly known as a short squeeze. And this could be a prime candidate for one since it has gone um, down quite substantially in the meantime in the past couple months. But I just wanted to compare this to uh, DraftKings and um, put up some of their financials and just see how honestly undervalued it is compared to DraftKings. So if we look here, the market capitalization is almost half. The PE, um, DraftKings isn't even um, expected to make money in the next five years. Um, and then if we go down, DraftKings price to sales is a 24, so that's eight times uh, 10 nationals, and their price to book is double. If we look, their enterprise value is negative, um, which is never a good thing when you see any of their financials negative, and their profit margin is negative 180%, so they're losing quite a lot of money, and their operating margin is negative 127%. We go down, we look, and we can see that they're not earning as much money. So they're only earning $830 million as opposed to $3.74 billion. And then their EBITDA is negative. So they're not earning money before taxes or interest. Their balance sheet is the one positive, I will say, which I was um, saying earlier. Their total uh, cash on hand is more than Penn Nationals. And they also have less debt. So they were able to pay down all of their debt and still have $1.5 billion in um, total cash on their balance sheet. But I don't really see that as a negative for Penn National because it is so manageable and they're able to pay, if they really wanted to, they could pay back their all of their debt in three years or less because they, they're going to be making money hand over fist as opposed to DraftKings where they're not going to be making money on the bottom line because they have to pay so much in advertising. And that is my really, really... Um, main point I wanted to make for my bold thesis is just that um, the advertising is done on uh, Barstool. They advertise the sports book. Dave Portnoy, although you don't have to like him, I don't personally like him, he has free advertisement wherever he goes. He is always talking up where whatever he's invested in and um, he's, he's going to be talking about it and trying to get the name out there and the brand exposed. So um, I am very bullish on Penn National if it starts to fall. Um, there is some support, as I said, in the uh, 70s range, and if it falls below that, I will be buying heavily and more heavily. If you made it this far, thank you very much for watching. Have a great day.